Hello, everyone. This is Thomas Miris. I'm the director of the Catholic Culture Podcast Network. If you listened to the previous episode of Way of the Fathers, then you're aware that Mike Aquilina, who hosted this show for 99 awesome episodes, is uh, moving on uh, to other things and being replaced by his handpicked successor, Jim Papandrea, who he introduced in the last episode. Now, we're all going to miss Mike. He did such a great job in building this podcast from nothing, and uh, we're sad to see him go. But I'm really excited about uh, the gifts and the expertise that Jim is bringing to the podcast. And uh, what you're about to hear is episode one of season four, in which Dr. Jim will be covering the early heresies of the Christian church. But if you don't mind, I just want to take a minute to talk about Catholic culture the organization and the website that uh, produces this podcast and all of the podcasts here on the Catholic Culture Podcast Network. CatholicCulture.org is actually in its 20th year of operation this past year. It was founded in 2003 uh, by my father, Jeffrey Miris, and uh, actually worth mentioning that not only Way of the Fathers is undergoing a transition of leadership, but so is Catholic Culture, the whole the whole organization, the whole uh, nonprofit behind it, Trinity Communications, uh, because my father, Jeffrey, is retiring, and uh, I am... Uh, being given the responsibility and privilege of taking over the apostolate that he founded. So as of this summer, I was made uh, president of Trinity Communications, and I'm in the gradual process of taking responsibility for running operations at catholicculture.org. So uh, first of all, I'd ask you to pray for me and our apostolate so that we can continue to serve the church better and better in the years to come. But also, I want to mention that Catholic culture is in the midst of its fall fundraising campaign, and a number of generous donors have gotten together to offer us a $100,000 matching challenge grant. Anything that you donate from now until December 8th will be doubled up to $100,000. So now is the best time you can give even a little bit will count double during this period. So if you enjoy Way of the Fathers and our other podcasts and perhaps uh, the resources on our website as well, please consider going to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio and uh, make whatever contribution you feel inspired to make and we'll be deeply grateful uh as mike used to always end his episodes with we do pray for our benefactors every day and all of our listeners uh so thank you god bless you and i hope you really enjoy the new way of the father's host dr jim papandrea Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a production of CatholicCulture.org. I'm Jim Papandrea, author and professor of church history and historical theology, and I'm honored to have been asked to pick up the baton on this podcast from my dear friend and colleague and co-author, Mike Aquilina. I expect that, just as Roger Moore could never quite replace Sean Connery, I can never quite fill the shoes of that master storyteller, Mike Aquilina. But I do hope and pray that I will bring my own unique perspective to the role. Specifically, I am also a Catholic layperson, but in my day job, I teach in a Protestant seminary, so I am what you might call ecumenically bilingual. And that is specifically because the time period I specialize in, the early church, is the inheritance of all Christians. It is our common background. It is the very thing that all Christians have in common the trunk of the family tree, if you will, and it belongs to all of us. And in fact, there is something here for everyone in the history of early Christianity, no matter what your religious faith is or your level of engagement with religion. So I want to thank you for joining me on what Mike has called a podcast pilgrimage. I like that. And in fact, I like to think that all of life itself is a pilgrimage. And no pilgrimage is possible without the guidance of people who have gone before us. And that's who the fathers are, the fathers of the church. And there are mothers, too. These are the ones who have handed the faith on from teacher 
to student, master to apprentice in each generation. I'm going to begin my tenure as the host of this podcast with a series on the heresies. This will be a 14-episode series, that is if you count this introductory episode. In these episodes, we will explore the teachings of the Church Fathers as they corrected those who had gone astray. So we will not only learn what went wrong in the teachings of the ancient heresies, but we will clarify the mainstream consensus of what was handed down as the historic faith in each generation, in opposition to the mistakes that some made, and some still make, since there is virtually nothing new under the sun, and all of the ancient heresies have their modern counterparts. But before we can get into the topic, I need to define some terms. What do we mean when we say something is a heresy? Heresy is a Greek word that means something like going off on a tangent, or going off track, veering off the straight and narrow, so to speak, and crossing a line to become something other than the mainstream. And yes, there was a mainstream church, even in the early days. The mainstream of the church is that which most faithfully received what the previous generation of the mainstream had handed down to them, going all the way back to the apostles and coming from Jesus himself. We call this unbroken chain of discipleship apostolic succession. And so, what I am calling the mainstream of the church is where the correct doctrine is found. If heresy is that which deviates from the mainstream, then orthodoxy is that which is correct precisely because it maintains the tradition. And by the way, orthodoxy is also a Greek word, or compound word. Literally, it means correct praise, but we use it to mean correct doctrine, correct teaching. Now, the mainstream of the church happens to be the majority in any given age, but it's not that the mainstream is orthodox because it's the majority. The mainstream is the majority because it is orthodox. Most people simply stick with what most of the bishops are teaching, which is what they had received from the bishops of the previous generation. To be a heretic means to deviate from what was received and teach something else. To be a heretic doesn't simply mean being wrong about something. We're all wrong about something. To be a heretic means to teach something that is mutually exclusive with the tradition that you received from your teachers. And people did that, and they were confronted by their teachers. And when they were confronted, if they refused to get back on track, if they refused to teach what they had received and insisted on teaching something else, and when they gathered followers and led them away from the mainstream, then they were declared to be heretics, and what they taught is heresy. Now, you might ask why it matters. Why couldn't the church just let everyone believe whatever they want? And I will be answering this question all along the way, but for now, in short, there are things that are true and things that are not true, especially about God. The things that are true will lead us closer to God. The things that are not true lead us away from God because they propose to us a different God, one who does not exist. So for the early Christians, souls are at stake. Well, now we've gotten to the point where I need to dispel a common myth. I recently read an article where the author made a reference to a time before the so-called victory of orthodoxy as if there was a time when orthodoxy itself didn't yet exist. Now, this author was a good enough historian to nuance his statement by saying, orthodoxy as it is today. But that's the point, isn't it? The orthodoxy of today, in order to be orthodoxy, has to be consistent with the orthodoxy of the tradition. But the common myth is that orthodoxy came late to the party, and that before that, there was a variety of alternatives, all supposedly equally valid. Well, that's not really how it worked in the history of our Christian faith. There was never a time without orthodoxy. 
each generation has its orthodoxy, and each generation's orthodoxy is built on the foundation of the previous generation's orthodoxy. So doctrine does develop over time, but only in the sense of being clarified, never in the sense of changing from one thing into something else. So there is no such thing as a time before orthodoxy, and there is no such thing as proto-orthodoxy or pre-orthodoxy. There is an orthodoxy in every generation, because orthodoxy is precisely that which was handed down from the previous generation. And we can see in the writings of the Church Fathers that they know what orthodoxy is in their time, and they know what deviates from orthodoxy to the extent that it crosses the line into heresy. You see, the history of doctrine is nothing other than the history of interpretation. In other words, doctrine is a clarification of the correct interpretation, not only of Scripture, but of the very incarnation itself and the person of Jesus. Jesus himself asked this question, Who do you say that I am? And the history of doctrine is the history of the church answering that question. And especially in the early church, each generation builds on the tradition in a way that fleshes it out and clarifies it. In fact, there are three observations we can make. I call these three observations my three laws of the development of doctrine. It's kind of an homage to the three laws of robotics from science fiction, uh, but they're not really laws. They are three observations about how the development of doctrine always works throughout history. Law one is that heresy forces orthodoxy to define itself. In other words, orthodoxy comes first because it begins with Jesus and then is handed down from the apostles. But often it's just taught from teacher to student in an oral tradition, and it's not written down until there is some challenge to it. So there is a sense in which a lack of controversy is evidence of consensus. But then an alternative interpretation is offered, and a debate begins. And that debate ends with a clarification of the doctrine in question. And that clarification is specifically written to exclude whatever is not consistent with the tradition. In other words, orthodoxy is clarified to rule out the heresy that opposes it. Now, law number two is that orthodoxy is the middle way between the extreme alternatives. It is simply an observable fact of history that the heresies are on the extremes, because every heresy is, in some way, pushing the boundaries of belief and going off on a tangent. Or another way to say this is that all heresy focuses on one thing and emphasizes it to the exclusion of something else. Let me give you an example. The teaching handed down from the apostles, the teaching of the mainstream church and the majority of the bishops, was always that Jesus Christ has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. But the challenges to this teaching, the alternatives, all either emphasized his humanity so much that they diminished or denied his divinity, or they emphasized his divinity so much that they diminished or denied his humanity. Now, I don't want to give away too much of the good stuff before we really start, but the point is that the teaching received from the apostles ruled out any conception of Christ that was not fully divine, and it also ruled out any conception of Christ that was not fully human. And we can see a kind of pendulum effect as one preacher or teacher pushes the boundaries to one extreme, and the mainstream bishops and other theologians have to correct that, clarifying the doctrine to pull it back within the boundaries. But then someone inevitably reacts so strongly to the heresy of one extreme that they overreact and overcorrect and go to the other extreme. And again, the mainstream church fathers have to clarify the doctrine 
to bring it back to that place of balance in the middle. Not as a compromise, but to go with the pendulum analogy, that place where gravity brings the pendulum to the middle. It's the refusal to accept an either-or answer, and the conviction that the right answer is the both-and answer, even if that means living with some measure of paradox. Jesus Christ is fully human and fully divine, not simply one or the other. So, law one is that heresy forces orthodoxy to define itself. Law two is that orthodoxy is the middle way between the extreme alternatives. And law three is that Christology informs soteriology. This means that whatever you decide to believe about Christ, Christology, will determine what you believe about salvation, soteriology. What you believe about the Savior determines what you will believe about how salvation works. Or vice versa, if you start with a particular soteriology or theory of atonement, you will necessarily back into a particular Christology. And the point is that these are interdependent. Well, that's enough introduction for now. As we anticipate getting into the specifics of each heresy, here's what you can look forward to, what I will talk about in each episode. We're going to be looking at the heresies chronologically. In general, they come up as a reaction to something, like in my pendulum example. So we can take them in turn and track through the history of the early church. In fact, the first ones we will talk about can already be seen, at least hinted at, in the New Testament. Once I set the stage by putting the heresy into the timeline, I will explain what the heresy is. What were the particular heretics teaching? I will tell you who the teachers were, if we know, and when they lived, and what they thought they were responding to, or what their motivation was for teaching this particular heresy. Because we do have to give the heretics at least some credit. It's not as though they were trying to destroy the church. For the most part, they sincerely thought they were right. And it's important to notice that heresy is always a problem within the church. If it were outside of the church, it would be just another religion. And some of the heresies did evolve into completely separate religions. But heresy begins within the church, promoted by apparently sincere believers who believed that they had discovered a better teaching than what they had received. They thought that they had interpreted the person of Christ and the scriptures in a way that was more correct than their teachers. And they thought that they were saving souls. But they were in the minority, because most people thought that they were leading souls away from salvation. So then we'll talk about what's at stake. Why is the particular heresy problematic? Why is it more than just a matter of opinion? And why did it need to be addressed? What are the implications of this heresy? In other words, what would it mean if the heretics were right and the mainstream was wrong? Then I'll talk about the church fathers who opposed the heresy in question. We'll look at who they were and when they lived. And through their response to the heresy, we will see the mainstream teaching. We will talk about orthodoxy by contrast with the heresy. And as I mentioned, that's really how orthodoxy gets clarified over time in response to the heretics. Finally, whenever possible, I will mention the modern versions of the ancient heresies. How is this particular heresy still around? Not as a judgment of anyone's faith or any particular groups that exist today, but simply to point out that the groups which may be seen as existing on the fringes of the church today, what they believe is not new, and there were versions of the same beliefs on the fringes of the church in the early centuries as well. So that's my introduction to our series on the heresies. Next time on The Way of the Fathers, we will get into our first heresy, the Ebionites. Thanks for listening. Decorum solemnitate.
Gauden Tangeli Er kollaudant filium Dei Way of the Fathers is a production of catholicculture.org Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings. Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. And the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.